good morning to all the participants so today's session we have amongst us uh, dr mukesh agrawal managing director of 3d product development a private indian uh, a private limited indian firm he is founded in year 2000 is a entrepreneur scientist consultant author and speaker uh company provides technical services and strategic uh, consulting in rapid prototyping and rapid coding through his company dr agrawal has provided services to over 5500 organizations in india and abroad for the past 25 years dr agrawal has focused his education research and practice on design prototyping and material processing over this span of time he has authored more than 50 articles and technical papers and has been awarded five patents on materials and rpd he completed his bachelor degree in 1988 in metallurgical engineering from indian institute of technology madras now chennai subsequently in 1994 he earned his phd in materials engineering from the university of texas at austin usa specializing in rpd processes and materials so with this brief interview we welcome uh, dr agrawal welcome sir thank you dr sitesh uh, can everybody hear me yes sir okay so <clears throat> the topic i have been given is uh, additive manufacturing or design for rapid prototyping and rapid coding which today is more commonly referred to as additive manufacturing Are you able to hear me, or everybody? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, I'm first giving you a brief uh, background of what is additive manufacturing. You know? So we'll just spend about five minutes uh, touching upon the basics of uh, additive manufacturing. Let me do the screen share here. Okay, are you able to see the presentation now? Is everybody able to see the presentation? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, sorry, I've never done this before. I've done a lot of meetings, uh, not done a one and a half hour presentation. So please bear with me. Uh, okay. So what is additive manufacturing? Additive manufacturing is basically a technology that we always have known as rapid prototyping for the last twenty-five years. Yeah. Or more popularly in the mainstream, it's known as 3D printing. But at the industrial level, and I think uh, since we are talking about an engineering an institute here or a technical institute, it's best to refer to it as additive manufacturing, you know, uh, because that sounds more technology-oriented and more uh, industry-oriented. But at the end of the day, they are all one and the same: rapid prototyping or 3D printing or additive manufacturing. So. Basically, you create an object from your computer-aided design, layer by layer, using some kind of a material. So, what it has done is it has kind of changed the way we have always thought of manufacturing. Historically, we have thought of manufacturing either through machining or through dye and mold technologies. So, in the last 25, 30 years, this has kind of changed the way we look at manufacturing. Especially in the last 10 years, uh, after the Direct metal, you know, you could make actual metallic components of titanium, stainless steel. So things have really got heated up at an at an industrial scale in the last ten years, and that's why we say it's led to democratization of manufacturing. You know? uh, if you go back and look at uh, about ten years back, uh, President Obama started a program in the U.S. called uh, America Makes, and under that program, the idea was that You don't need to send the jobs for manufacturing uh, across the ocean to China or to India. You can just have a bunch of these machines, and you can manufacture your component only on demand. You don't even have to manufacture and keep them uh, in your uh, inventory anymore. So I'm sure all of you know this uh, that you have a CAD file. So that's the most uh, basic need of the 3D printing or 3D manufacturing. Is you need a CAD file, and then you have an interface software that comes with almost all the machines. You know, they all have their own 
proprietary software. Where the CAD file is oriented in the right means because you have you're always going to build in the Z direction, not vertically up from bottom up. So you have to orient the part in the Z direction you know, relative to the build direction. And once you do that, you have to of course slice the part. And then of course a machine comes along and uh, actually lays down the layer of material and builds the part layer by layer. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. Uh, today, a lot of things have happened in the last 30 years. Today, if we look at some of the mainstream technologies, we know them as stereolithography or selective laser sintering, uh, also referred to as powder bed fusion or DMLF, direct metal laser sintering, or SLM, uh, selective laser melting. But at the end of the day, they're all the conventional word of selective laser sintering. And then, of course, you have a very popular technology called fused deposition modeling. And now you have what is called a bind digit fusion or bind digit printing, uh, which uh, HP has uh, recently popularized in the last three, four, five years. So these are the kind of uh, machines that look like. Okay. What I'm not uh, talking about here are we also have this what we call a desktop thing. You know, these are these are small machines. Most of them are based on this FDM technology, and they're, they're basically very small desktop machines. You can have them even at your home and you can print out a component if you have a CAD design. So what we are talking here is mostly industrial theory printing or industrial rapid prototyping. And those are the technologies we call as additive manufacturing. On this, on the right, on your screen, you will see this schematic. This is the way uh, stereolithography, this process works. Again, I won't go too much into detail here. Okay, uh, again, just running through, uh, Today, uh, additive manufacturing has found application across everything. I mean, you can you can name any aspect of industry, and we are using this technology. Maybe for as simple a job as prototyping to complete manufacturing of uh, five, ten, fifteen, uh, even thousands of components. So, automotive has always been the lead uh, industry player in any technology for a moment. And then you have heavy engineering, industrial engineering, the likes of uh, switch gears and heavy equipments. Uh, jewelry is very interesting. You know? uh, this technology of 3D printing was uh, used very heavily in jewelry. And I think it originated in India, in uh, Mumbai, where a lot of uh, this technology was used by a lot of the jewelry companies who were catering to all the global uh, retailers. You know, from, Walmart, to JCPenney, to uh, Tiffany's. And, but the Mumbai companies in the early 2000s, they modernized. They said, you know, they want to become more modern technology. And that's when 3D printing became a uh, commonplace activity. And aerospace, now, this is interesting. In the last 10 years, after this metal 3D printing or metal array manufacturing came up, uh, the next to this aerospace and healthcare are really. Uh, embrace this technology in a big way. I will see some examples later on in the presentation. And then, of course, uh, very traditional industry like foundry and casting have used this technology very well, I would say, and transform the way we make uh, castings. You know, castings have been around for thousand. Uh, I think from the time when uh, Neanderthals used to roam around in forests, they would actually take a piece of metal and actually heat it and beat it up, right, to make a spear. Now, then they learned how to melt the material. So basically, casting has been around for a long time. But now, uh, additive manufacturing is changing the way we do casting. All right, so since a lot of the uh, thing I'm going to talk about is based on additive manufacturing, and we use the word additive manufacturing mostly for metallic components. And we are making components from one of these technologies using metal. Okay. It can be titanium, stainless steel, internal. So one of the most widely used technologies is powder bed fusion. So as I said, we can call it SLM, we can call it DMLS, SLM is selective laser melting. DMLS is uh, selective laser sintering. So I'll take a pause here and see if anybody has any questions at this point. So, if anybody has a question, I can take that up right now. Uh, on content that I've presented so far.
Okay. So I guess um, we we'll move on then. Okay. I see there's a inside. All right. Um, doesn't look like there are any questions. So moving on um, once again. Can you all see the screen again? Okay, so powder bed fusion, that's the technology that's most widely used for um, metal uh, additive manufacturing. Okay. So let's understand how the process works. Okay. Like any other uh, 3D printing or uh, additive manufacturing, you have to start with the STL file, the CAD file. Then you have to orient the file. As I said, as I told you earlier, you have to orient the art with respect to the X, Y, Z. And while orientation, orienting the part, you have to make sure that you, know, you won't have certain delicate features coming all the way to the top, requiring any kind of support. See, any, any feature which is which becomes an overhang or an undercut will require support. You know, because it's like construction of a building. When you're doing the roof, you need scaffold underneath to sustain the uh, roof structure until it has completely got set. The same thing with uh, 3D printing or uh, the manufacturing. You need supports for any kind of unsupported area in the power. So your orientation becomes very critical. And once you have uh, oriented the part, you have to generate supports. So what you see here, the red color are your support structures. And once you have done that, your software or your algorithm goes ahead and slices the parts uh, from bottom up into finite layers of uh, 0.1 mm or 0.15 mm layer thickness. So that's about 100 micron or 50 micron layer thickness. Then you'll have a finite number of slices, which are kind of stacked over each other. And this is all still on, at a software level. And then for each layer, you have to generate your tool part. You know, the laser has to scan the powdered material, or have to lay down the material. So you have to generate your tool part, just like CNC machine. Next. Uh, once you have done that, so each each machine, for example, this company SLM has a software called the uh, additive designer. So don't pay attention to that. But bottom line is all machine manufacturers have their own proprietary software, which helps you orient the file, uh, generate your supports, slice your path, file, generate your tool path, optimize your tool path generation. Some of them even do what we call as a, a little bit of simulation, build simulation. It will even tell you if at some point you will have any kind of crash uh, of the hardware with your material and so on. So, and also with some of the softwares can also tell you how long it will take and if you have a, a fixed pricing in mind, it can give you your costing also. Okay. Right. Once you have created your file, you know, you have generated your MC code, as we say in CNC machine, all that MC code has to be now. Uh, sent to a machine, a hardware. So let's talk about in process. This is best explained here. So you have a, uh, the raw material is a loose powder. So the loose powder is kept in a hopper here and it's allowed to come through a funnel and you spread that loose powder on a platform, on a piston, a cylinder piston or anything. So you spread a thin layer of powder. Then the next step is you have a laser. You see the laser up here? You switch it on and it stands across the powder. So wherever the powder beams hits the, uh, the laser beam hits the powder, the powder melts and solidifies. And it's happening at a pretty rapid pace. You'll just see a video in a few seconds. And once one layer is complete, you lower the piston down by a certain amount, spread another layer of powder and keep repeating the process. So I'm again sure most of you are familiar with this. So let's see how the um, okay. so let's look at how the process works here. Uh, 
I hope this will work. So what you're seeing is the, uh, basically the build preparation. That's the first step. You brought in your part, you can see your platform virtually, and you're going to orient the part more. So get rid of the music and I can fly out. So once you have oriented the part, you also go on to get your machine ready. So that's basically a, a kind of a what you use to clean your lenses, you wear glasses like I do. We clean our lenses. So you have to clean all the optics. Okay, so you're cleaning the optics here. And you can see that. So there are many optics here. You put your build platform into the machine. So your first layer will be created on top of this. And you see now the a layer of powder has been spread on that wind platform. See this, you do this a couple of times to make sure you have a smooth layer. And then you close your chamber. And you have your bin file which has come from your software. That's pretty much it, okay? And now the process begins. So you see, wherever the laser is scanning, the material becomes dark, so it's basically melted there. Okay? And what the material here is Internet 718. And now the, another layer of powder has been spread, and the laser is scanned. You see the, the recorder, we call it recorder, what the instrument that uh, spread the powder did not go to the other end, you're saving time. And once all the layers are completed, the platform comes back up and you clean up, you, you, you collect all your loose powder, okay? That's the beauty of this technology. You have no wastage, almost zero wastage. And you see the part is now actually bonded, it's welded to the base plate. The base plate itself is stainless steel. And now you bring that and now you have to do a little bit of manual work. Um, normally, you would take that base plate, uh, what the video didn't show is you would take the base plate to a wire cutting machine and actually wire cut the entire uh, part from the base plate. Okay. So, moving on. So, as I said, you have to unpack. You saw that he removed the part from the build, uh, got rid of all the loose powder around the part. Then you have to separate the part from the substrate plate so that it was done. That is normally done using a wire cutting. And then manually remove the supports as much as you can, clean any channels that you may have, and then if required, you also take it for fine and machine. Okay, so you may a lot of these parts do require fine and machine to get the right tolerances. So here's another uh, video that shows you, you know. So here you see a lot of a pretty big part, you know, and instead of a wire cutting, he's using a hand grinder. And two. Okay, so you can do this if your supports are very light. You know, this is very easy to remove because these are all the support what you see here. I mean, the actual component is up here. So 
So, okay. So if you look at, um, I mean, these machines are available from many manufacturers. Some of the primary manufacturers are uh, German companies, a uh, com company called SLM Solutions, and also a company called EOS. Um, so here I'm showing you just some of the machines that are available. You have large machines uh, with platform size of 500 by 280 by 365. They have, they tend to have two lasers or four lasers. So you know, by having multiple lasers, you are basically increasing your throughput. Four lasers are dancing across. You can see a video shot. Then you also have uh, smaller machines, which is 280 by 280. And now I believe there are even bigger machines, about 500 by 700 mm machines. And then there are small machines, which are really good for uh, universities such as yourself, and also for uh, a lot of dental and uh, medical applications. Because typically in dental and medical, the parts are not very big. You want to use a small machine. Okay. Uh, as I said, there are a variety of materials, and uh, you have uh, exotic materials like titanium, cobalt chrome alloys, to a variety of tool steels and uh, conventional steels, 316, 304, 174 pH, 155 pH, uh, a lot of nickel alloys, so these are again super alloys, which are used in uh, quite heavily in the aerospace industry. A lot of aluminium alloys, you have copper, and so you can you can come up with your own alloy. So you can develop your own alloy, you can develop your own powder, but the powder has to be spherical. So the powder has to be gas atomized powder. And I think uh, this chart shows you the kind of uh, materials that are uh, readily available and their applications. So I already mentioned your medical grade applications, your aerospace, your variety of alloys. And you even have pure copper now. So you can do a lot of electrical uh, components. All right. So as I mentioned, now there are machines with multiple lasers, okay. uh, two lasers, four lasers working in tandem with each other. I mean, this video will show you a test. I think. Here you see four lasers are beautifully dancing in perfect rhythm and completing a part, completing multiple parts across the platform. Although, let me uh, mention that uh, having multiple lasers is good for productivity, but it can cause an additional problem. What if there is a a particular portion of a particular part which is hit by two different lasers. So in this area it's hit by one laser and in this area it's hit by another laser. So you can have an overlap problem okay, and which can affect your mechanical properties and physical properties. So there are algorithmic ways of sorting out uh, some of those problems. All right, so now having covered that, let me just share with you. Additive manufacturing has got a lot of advantages. I'm not saying it's the it's going to ever replace conventional manufacturing by no imagination. So, so don't mistake that AIM or 3D printing is going to take over the world one day. No. It's only going to complement only certain things which make more sense through additive manufacturing will happen to additive manufacturing. And what makes sense? Well, if your volumes are very low, your components are very complex. If you are looking at uh, not maintaining high inventory because your comp components are very expensive to maintain inventories, you want to do your manufacturing at your local center rather than source it at thousands of kilometers away from. You want to do just in time uh, death inventory management. So, those are all your reasons for doing additive manufacturing. Okay. In life, any technology, whether it's uh, CNC machining, whether it's casting, whether it's foundry technologies or uh, sheet metal forming, I'm sure as technical experts, all of you appreciate that there are a variety of factors that can influence your final product quality. Right? Same thing applies in additive manufacturing. So of course, at the center of everything, uh, despite we keep hearing about advances, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, and other things are making. But let's not forget, um, and I think COVID has taught us that beautifully, is the human being is always going to be at the center of everything. Right? So your operator, you are at the center of what kind of part quality you get. And then of course, we have other things. 
you have your machine what kind of machine are you using a single laser machine dual laser machine big machine small machine you have your powder what is your powder quality good has your powder got some level of oxidation on it and so on and so forth material so these are one and the same but uh, basically we are saying what kind of material are you using are you using aluminium or using stainless steel so if you're using aluminium are you using aluminium from supplier xyz with the mean particle size of 30 micron or are you using aluminium from supplier abc with the mean particle size of 28 micron the 2 micron can make a difference what kind of parameters if you are using aluminium you and 28 micron particles your parameters will be different if you are using 28 micron aluminium from a different supplier the parameters can vary the preparation how did you prepare your bead did you how did you orient the part how did you slice the part what was the slice thickness that you used and last but not the least design so today's uh, talk is also going to be mostly with design so we have now been 20 minutes since i've been talking so now we'll jump into the design aspects of aditi manufacturing now what is an aim compatible design Can we? Shall we just say that let's make anything out of aditi manufacturing? The answer to that is no. You you should not use a technology which is so expensive and so high technology just to make a simple uh, component. The component should be something which is compatible, which makes technical as well as commercial sense for aditi manufacturing. For example, if you have something that is extremely bulky, you know, I think all of us appreciate that when we go to machining, if anything that is very lightweight, machining becomes expensive because you have to remove a lot of material. In additive manufacturing, it's exactly the opposite. Anything that is bulky or voluminous will become very expensive and not suitable for you. Anything that is lightweight or is very uh, Lattice like structure or very thin wall structures and so on becomes really good for additive manufacturing. So whenever you think of CNC machining, think of additive manufacturing as an exact counter opposite of that when it comes to design compared to design. Right. So I'll take another break here and ask you if you have any questions. If anyone has any questions, are you all able to? Hear me correctly. Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. So, shall we continue? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Great. All right. So, design for additive manufacturing. Okay. So, now let's get into the design aspects. As I said, you you should not put everything through additive manufacturing. Anything that can be done through conventional manufacturing, uh, without any reasons for going to already manufacturing please don't go so so we all know in the past as designers okay, and i think all of you are uh, designers right we we think of something we, we think of a lot of exotic uh, designs but then reality hits us and we say oh man we can't manufacture this there's, there's no way i can produce this It's too complex, uh, so we have to look at design and say, okay, what is possible and what is not possible. So obviously, in past designers were limited in their ability to actually think crazy. So parts were quite simple, and because there were not many exotic manufacturing technologies, but as CNC machining became better from Simple lathe and milling machines. We went to CNC. There we went from three axis to four axis to five axis, and now you have multiple axis. So you, you are able to do more complex geometries. You have wire cutting. You have electro discharge machining. So all of this led to more complex designers and designs getting realized. Right? Additive manufacturing has brought in another level of uh, freedom. You can say, but there are still limitations. and we'll talk about that so what aim can do is we can create complex designs 
Another great thing about additive manufacturing is you can now bring a lot of components which earlier required uh, welding and uh, you needed to uh, brace them together or something to make a complete assembly. You can now collapse them and say, hey, I can make the entire assembly as a single part. Now imagine that if you have a, I'll show you some case studies. If you have a component or a sub-assembly which consists of let's say 10 parts which are either bolted together or welded together. See, all of those 10 parts require a different die or a mold. And then each of them is manufactured and then each of them, and then you need an assembly line to bring all those 10 parts and you need an assembly line to actually do the welding, you need an assembly line to do the bolting. If you can make all those 10 components as a single piece, imagine the amount of savings you've got, you've completely eliminated an assembly line of welding. I mean, that's huge. So, those are the benefits. Uh, there are ASTM guidelines now available uh, for design guidelines for DFAM, to design for additive manufacturing. And basically, if uh, some of you have read the book, um, Move My Cheese, I mean, we know that uh, when you think of additive manufacturing, I mean, the educational curriculum itself has to change now. I, I don't know at your university, but I know that NIT Warrenland has a full fledged curriculum now on uh, additive manufacturing with these and design for additive manufacturing being a big part of that. So these changes will have to come right from the grassroots level, that is at the correct education level. The design for additive manufacturing will have to be taught uh, to students and then to engineers who are working in factories. So, these are the benefits that uh, AIM has done. You know. As I said, it has allowed us to make components lighter. So, if you look at this bracket here, okay, this was the original design. It weighed about uh, 2 kg. Okay. And after redesign, it weighs only 327 grams. Can, can, you, can you imagine that? Something weighing less than 1 fourth or 1 fifth, or even 1 sixth here. That's unbelievable. And yet, it performs as well as the original uh, bracket. So you can do lightweight. You can do lattice structures. So again, for the purposes of lightweighting, you can do lattice structures. So things like this. Why, why is this so much important on lightweighting? Okay. Here's, an, here's a snapshot for you. This is the amount an industry is willing to pay to reduce their weight by one kg. An aerospace company will pay almost 10,000 euro to reduce the payload by one kg. I mean, that's huge. An aircraft company, an aviation company, will pay almost a thousand euro to reduce the weight by one kg. Now you know why they charge you for extra baggage when you travel. An automotive industry is willing to pay 10 euro per kg of weight reduction. Then it, it needs that much benefit. So weight reduction is very important. Okay. So it does aim, as I said, does it give you complete design freedom? Not really. I mean, when you're designing something, even AM has its limitations as we speak today. There is a minimum feature size you can create. Okay? That depends on the machine, but generally speaking, you will have a feature size limitation. The kind of surface finish you can do. Uh, at the end of the day, it's powder, right? I mean, the powder particle size is, let's say, 30 micron uh, average particle size. Obviously, and you're building layer by layer, so in the Z direction, in the vertical direction, you will have a, a layer finish. Uh, you will have overhang features, okay? and those overhang features may require support. And when you remove the support, that area will be a little bit uh, disfigured, let's say. So you want to obviously minimize support. So when you're designing your component, you want to keep that in your mind that you have to minimize support. You don't want to have distortion. While, as you create the component in your machine, you need to avoid distortion. I'll talk about some of these points a little more. Okay. So when you start designing, okay, uh, you start with your product specification, of course. You're designing for conventional manufacturing. And sometimes, you say, hey, I'm happy with my conventional design, but I want it to be manufactured because I need only five numbers. So 
even though it's designed for conventional manufacturing, but I need only five numbers. So I'll go to additive manufacturing. But you may have to do certain changes to your conventional design to make it applicable for additive manufacturing. We call it ad adaptable for additive manufacturing. Or you may decide, well, I want to do a lot of weight series. I want to make it more uh, robust. I want to improve the performance. So then you will go directly from product specification to design. To design for additive manufacturing. You're not even designed for conventional manufacturing. So what is adaptation for additive manufacturing? Adaptation for additive manufacturing is nothing but taking a conventional design and making it suitable for your machine and your powder and your material. You're not designing it for additive manufacturing. You are adapting your conventional design for additive manufacturing. What that means is, see, I told you there are limitations with the machines. Think yourself. Even though you have a conventionally designed component, you have to say, okay, can I achieve some of those features which are possible through machining, but I can't necessarily achieve them through additive manufacturing. Because in additive manufacturing, you have a laser. So your laser spot diameter can determine how much you achieve. So typically, we take it as two to three times. So if my laser spot diameter is, let's say, 50 micron, we normally say that we cannot make a feature which is less than 100 micron or 150 micron. So that's that's a rule of thumb. And that makes sense, you know, the laser beam scans from one end to another. So 50 micron is getting heated and melted and solidified. Then the laser beam turns around and scans again. So another 50 micron. So there is an overlap that happens. So if we take two scan of 50 micron each, that's 100 micron. But remember that it's not just the laser beam is not just a simple laser beam of 50 micron diameter. It has a Gaussian energy profile. So it also tends to melt a little bit more than the laser beam diameter. That's why we say we take a, a thumb roll of two to three times the laser beam diameter as our feature size. So what is the minimum feature size we can produce? As I said, we normally would take, so here you see 70 micron spot size, that's a laser beam diameter. You take a lattice struts. The lattice struts is each of these, you know. You don't want to consider more than 140, or less than 140. You don't want to consider wall thickness of less than 150 to 200 micron for a 70 micron diameter laser beam. And all of this depends on the thermal conductivity of the powder, the energy imparted, the, the reflectivity of the powder, the absorptivity of the powder, whether the powder is able to absorb more energy or is reflecting away more energy, and a lot of factors come in. Next, even uh, when we talk about adapting an existing design for relative manufacturing, you have to worry about overhands. So you have an existing design, these are your layers in the Z direction, take the green ones, and then suddenly you have two yellow ones. So you can see this, the first few layers up to here, all the green ones, without any support, they will build fine. But the minute you get to these two yellow layers, you know, they need a little bit of support underneath. So uh, support is, you saw in the video uh, where he was cutting that support, uh, the part from the plate, he had a lot of support going all the way up to the top. So that, that's the kind of support you generate here. And of course, the red portion will completely distort. You know, you'll not even have a good part. But if you don't have support and, and a very high level of support, you'll have a distortion. Because you have a um, big angle which is more than 45 degrees. So you don't want to have that. So another small, uh, there are many, many factors. I'm just touching upon some of the uh, simple ones. Let's say you have this part and you're building it in this direction, in this direction. You have a small hole. You're fine, you know, it's less than 10 millimeter hole and it will build fine. But you have a big circle in the bit in between, you'll have to provide support. You see the support that is there inside this big circular hole. Or you can redesign it, all right? So you can redesign it like a tear shape. So instead of giving a circular uh, opening, you can give a tear shape opening. And now not, no support will be required. You see this? So it's your decision how you adapt your existing design for a ready manufacturing. 
You see, this is a circular board which will require a, a support, or you can go with this teardrop or diamond holes. It all depends on what your design criteria are. But if you have a circular hole, you may be able to remove support from outside, but what about all the support that is inside? Okay. So you have to worry about that. And that's why you may have to redesign this instead of a cylindrical uh, circular hole uh, through and through. You may have to go with that ear shape or that diamond shape uh, geometry. Or you are not able to do that. You need to stick with this geometry. Then the only way is to orient it this way. See the way the part is being oriented. But now this will lead to longer build time. You want to take a long time to build this part. And underneath all of this, all of this will need support. So it's all about uh, kind of optimizing your design and your build. We call it the build optimization. All right. Another major uh, problem that uh, everybody has to remember when both designing for a ready manufacturing, or even adapting for a ready manufacturing, is the residual stresses. See, the laser beam is moving at a very rapid pace. The powder is uh, not kept at a very high temperature. So imagine your laser beam strikes and you are working with stainless steel, or you are working with aluminium. In aluminium, you are going from, let's say, about the base plate on which you are building the part is, let's say, about 150 degrees. So that's your base plate temperature. But your powder is coming from the hopper, okay, and that's coming at room temperature. And your laser beam strikes that room temperature powder and melt immediately and within a fraction of a second, it takes the powder from room temperature all the way up to 700 degrees centigrade or 750, and then brings, cools it down. Right? So it's a very rapid melting and solidification process. Extremely rapid. In fact, it's so rapid that some uh, good material science people have tried to use this technology to create amorphous, amorphous materials. As we all know, that very rapid melting and solidification can lead to non-crystallization. You know, and which means you'll be able to create amorphous materials. Now, what is amorphous material good for? Very good magnetic property, right? So there are a lot of groups who are working on using this technology for creating amorphous uh, steel and magnetic uh, structures. So anyway, um, di not digressing from that. So residual stresses. Because of its rapid melting and solidification, you basically have a lot of heat that is getting trapped because every time the energy is basically going underneath and there's a lot of heat that's getting trapped. And all of these thermal stresses or thermal heat will result in mechanical stresses eventually. And that can lead to delamination. The, the, some of the geometry may just completely delaminate from each other. Or it can lead to distortion, you know, the part may curl up or curl down. So you want to avoid very high thick cross sections uh, to minimize your uh, residual stresses. So you see this here, you have this separation. The support has got completely separated from the Part. So you see, if you look at this, this, this support ends here. Actually, it's supposed to touch the part, and because it got separated, the part has got distorted here. You can see my arrow that I'm showing you here. So, idea is to avoid thick part sections um, and use thicker build plates. Maybe use higher temperature for the build plate, but you don't have too many options. Uh, you have to play around a lot with your uh, part design, the component design. All right. Uh, one, one thing let me mention is uh, there are also a lot of simulation software now. So from MSC Nastran, there is a software called Simopart. There's a company in Germany with a software called Amphion. And these are really good software. So we, we use those quite a lot. So every component, when we orient them, when we generate the support, we actually run a complete simulation, build simulation. I mean, really, are, these simulations are really quite effective. They tell you a lot. They can, they can predict this kind of separation. And very accurately. So we are able to do a lot of uh, changes to the design, to the build preparation using simulation software. So 
what you want to do is not not just design your component you also need to design your thing as i said how you generate your support what kind of support there are millions of concepts concepts of support okay so all of that can determine a good build or a failed build right. so you see let's take a small example here so this is the original design this you would do using machining or forging or something now <coughs> this is optimized okay this is really heavily optimized after doing a lot of finite element analysis and everything that this will be the most optimized case of material saving weight savings and performance enhancement but the problem is it has a lot of overhead and this is not really that great for doing a ready manufacturing so you do a adaptability for a ready manufacturing so you adapting the second one to for a ready manufacturing and you are providing some self supporting geometry here and this is your final design so this does not have as much weight savings as the topology optimization but it's better than the original design and also ready for a ready manufacturing so what you see here is a design for aim as well as adapted for aim so let's talk about now your play design for a ready man so you have a blank sheet okay. and you have all the product specification and you need to now design so true defam as we say are always clean sheet designs okay. they are not adapted for a ready man you may go back from a defam component like the in the previous one so this is designed for ready manufacturing but it has been then you have applied a fam adaptability to for ready manufacturing you may end up doing that here also you may start for a pure plate design for ready manufacturing and then you may have to take a step backward and say okay i have to adapt it for ready manufacturing and of course when you are doing all of this when you are designing for ready manufacturing you have to remember why you even doing this why you even designing for ready manufacturing are you going to get any cost benefit or are you going to get any performance benefit if not don't do it okay. stick to your conventional manufacturing so i'll give you a small example again of a hydraulic manifold cap um, so i'm sure all of you are familiar with the hydraulic manifold okay. so typically this one is operating at 200 to 500 bar and this hydraulic manifolds tend to be very bulky you know? and these are the key components of the hydraulic manifold but in the conventional hydraulic manifold we always make them very box like right I mean, this is a conventional hydraulic manifold extremely boxy high extremely heavy but if i were to only do this for adapted for ready manufacturing i would be going to this but if i go from blank sheet if i design it from blank sheet and i keep only performance in mind i'll end up with this so you see my conventional hydraulic manifold weighs about 5 kg wow i can adapt it and make it 1 kg and i can even go down to 0.4 kg can you believe that that's a huge amount of weight savings and yet same or better performance you see how many components have got combined If you go back and look at the number of components you had here, and finally you have just a single component. The whole thing is just one single piece. And if I can throw a little more, I think they will be point four kg. All right. So to summarize, uh, I'm not done. There, there is still more, but to summarize, uh, generally that your awareness of additive manufacturing characteristics, the process, the materials. is very important you cannot be a designer uh, sitting on a catia or uh, solid works and saying okay you know i know how to design because unfortunately um, none of these guys uh, catia and others have they, they have been working they they have started uh, giving me modules on their native cad platform for uh, already manufacturing but none of them are able to bring all that knowledge which comes only as a said as a user you know so typically it's a team effort you need a good simulation engineer you would need a good designer and also your already manufacturing engineer so 
At our company, we do that. We have a separate person for simulation, a person for design, uh, the guy who runs our machine, and the person who builds the prepare, prepares the build. So, on any any job we do, all four of them brainstorm together, and they run ideas off of each other. They run simulations, share all those information with each other. So you'll have to do that if you're going to do a good design for it. You know. And I'll share a small case study that we have done here uh, from our domestic uh, cases. Okay. So here we go, we'll look at some case studies. Now. <coughs> All right, this is world's most used and abused case. Uh, it's been around for almost five to ten years now. And what can I say about it? This is basically a fuel nozzle. Uh, for uh, G's uh, aircraft engine called Leaf engine. So G manufactures uh, aircraft engines, as most of you must be aware of. <coughs> and in fact, um, the light combined aircraft is uh, supposed to be equipped with one of the G engines, right? So like, this is the next generation engine called Leaf, L-E-A-P, Leaf engine. <coughs> G spent seven years just doing design and redesign and iteratively working on this fuel nozzle. Okay. So this fuel nozzle is in the engine shown somewhere here. Okay. And each engine has about nine of these fuel nozzles. And obviously it's a fuel nozzle, so it's a very, very high critical component. And because there's a lot of uh, aviation turbine fuel at ATF that's flowing through it at very high pressures. And this whole fuel nozzle used to consist of, I believe, approximately about 20 to 25 components, which were made out of uh, various uh, aerospace material like internal and others. And then they were welded and based and joined and uh, riveted together. So can you imagine the, for each union they need nine of these, and each of them were had about 20 or 25 parts. And they went about doing this uh, back in, I think, 2005 or 2006, 2004, if I'm not wrong. And by 2012 or 13, so after seven years, they had this component ready for uh, certification. And then it took almost two years for certification, uh, FAA, uh, Federal Aviation Administration certification. Because you cannot send anything in. Uh, up in the air without proper certification, especially if it's an aviation engine company. So today GE has a team of 600 engineers at 21 sites driving additive manufacturing. Today GE has a separate business unit called GE Additive. Uh, in India, they have a big activity going on at GE uh, under GE Additive. And so this fuel model is a classic uh, case study that pretty much everybody shows. And what it has done is, so what you see is this is your engine, the leap engine, and this is where this um, fuel nozzle goes. And as I told you, there are nine of them. So in each engine, there are nine of these fuel nozzles. The number of components, as I told you, from almost 25 or so, it went down to a two or three only. And the weight was reduced by almost 25%. And the most beautiful part is, they're able to improve the performance. So the durability and performance enhancement also happen. Obviously it happened, right? If you have one unified structure instead of a lot of welding and uh, riveting, you will obviously have a much better performance. Uh, some small examples, uh, bracket, okay. manifold bracket I can mention. This is the original uh, bracket and this is the OEM CAD. And this is the redesign one. You see the redesign one. Very different. Lot of savings. Lot of material savings. What I'm not showing you is the process uh, engaged. Okay. The process is not so simple. You have to do design, finite element analysis, redesign, again finite element analysis. So it goes through a number of iterations of uh, CAD, FEA, and so on. Okay. This is something we did here in uh, our company. This was a fuel injector for a DRDO for a missile. And so the, it's a, basically a fuel injector, so, so similar to what the fuel nozzle, but a more simpler component. 
So this injects fuel at a very high pressure and temperature. And what you see is the right highlighted area are the critical areas because that's where all the pressure is. The green are the treatment areas. What you see this is a, a cut cross section area. Okay. And then you have the yellow portion. This is the mounting tube. So this is where the component is mounted. So we work with DRDO on uh, redesigning this component to make it light away uh, without compromising any functional criteria. So we went through a lot of uh, iteration um, of doing this and in about one to one and a half months of back and forth iteration, uh, we were able to go from the initial model that was this to the final design, which is this. So you see how much, this is all uh, dead weight, here, the red portion. We have saved a lot of it. Even the base plate, we made a lattice structure. So the component to begin with was only 375 grams. So on 375 grams, you cannot have 50% weight savings. And so we were able to still achieve our 27% weight savings and bring it down to 275 grams. Performances wise, you can see that we have uh, improved on the warm ice stress. Uh, factor of safety is also at the same line. Uh, shear stress is almost the same as the original shear stress. And total deformation is also almost the same. So now we have made this component, we have submitted them to DRDO uh, in Hyderabad, and they are yet to get, they are undergoing testing, we are yet to hear from them. And once we get to get the results of, from DRDO, um, DRDO will probably also implement this in actual uh, test flights. This, this, is, this is significant. Remember, I, I showed you. That uh, and this, when you talk about missile, you talk about space. You're not even talking about uh, aviation. So every kilogram of weight savings is very significant. So you see the originally printed component, and this was the redesigned printed component. Um, th this is again a, a good example of. Uh, you know, it's not really a design example or case study, but I like to show this. That you can do a lot of repair work. You know, with already manufacturing, you can do. I mean, you don't have to throw uh, old, uh, worn-out components. So, in an aircraft engine, you typically have a lot of uh, uh, blades, you know, and these blades get worn out. So, typically, the blade has a life of, uh, in case of uh, ground-based uh, turbine engines like uh, the power uh, sector, those. Blades typically have anywhere from 7 to 12 years of life. In case of air, airborne blades, uh, aircraft engine blades, the life is about 3 to 7 years. What if you could extend the life of these blades instead of completely replacing the blade itself in the aircraft? And you see, in an aircraft, there are hundreds of these blades in an engine, whether it's a power, power sector turbine engine or an aircraft turbine engine. There are hundreds of blades. Okay? In each of these, you have hundreds of blades. And I just show you this video of how you can do repair of these blades, of the worn out blade, and again get back maybe 30% of its life. You know? If you can get back, say, about two years of life back into the blade, that's quite a, quite a good achievement to do. So just watch this. Okay, so what you see here is is placing a worn out blade. So they have created some kind of a, a assembly fixture, you know. So in that they place a lot of these blades, which are all worn out. And the worn out portion has already been kind of uh, leveled off through machining or grinding operation. You see, on a single on a single big platform, he's going to mount almost about six into five, about 30, 40 blades.
you see the top portion of this uh, worn out uh, plate. So those are, those are completely worn out and have been machined to bring all of them to the same level. All he's doing is trying to make sure that all of them are now going to be at the same Z height. <coughs> now he places that entire build plat platform, I call it build platform, into the A machine. We spread the first layer of powder onto that, and now the process begins of actually depositing material onto existing tip of interval gates. So you saw that now a worn out blade has got fully repaired now. And it can extend the entire aircraft engine's life by another 20, 30, 40 percent. And that, that's amazing. Okay, here's some examples of uh, redesigned automotive components. So your current two piece design has been redesigned to one piece. <coughs> this is a differential uh, housing and bracket. So you see the components, uh, weight reduction of 50% and so on and so forth. There are, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples. And one of the most, again, uh, classic example is uh, a BMW i8 Roadster, which is a convertible uh, sports car. It has this rooftop that uh, slides over. You know? So you have, you have this bracket that has to open the rooftop, the soft top of the roof. So today, a BMW manufactures all those brackets. So you see this bracket here. Manufactures all of these brackets out of uh, already manufactured. And so you see the efficient work to 60,000 components against many die casting. <clears throat> so and this, this is the last slide in the last video. So that's the bracket, very lightweight, and it holds the whole uh, roof together, you know, and it retracts and uh, goes back into its position to open and close the roof. So, 
to summarize yeah, 3d printing rapid prototyping or a ready manufacturing you can use this in many ways we started off in the 90s by using rapid prototyping for what we call as for prototyping directly from chat we said okay you now i can use rapid prototyping and that's why we called it rapid prototyping for <clears throat> checking our design for testing our components and before going into manufacturing then we went into low volume parts we said okay can we make low volume parts we started doing direct part Uh, consolidations so a lot of these were good but now we are getting to the top we can really use aim and design things specifically for aim so when we when we were using this technology for prototyping we never actually designed something for this technology we were always designing for injection molding or a pressure die casting and simply making a prototype using silicon today by using the top end That is the this D fan and the part consolidation that comes with it. I mean, the amount of financial benefit, the amount of production benefits. Uh, you can do light weighting. You have faster product mount. You have product reliability. So you are able to achieve a lot of things because you are now using all of the following. You are using rapid prototyping for your design validation and so on. We are actually doing direct part replacement. We are doing part consolidation. We are doing so many things. So, but you need to make sure that you use all of these levels of engagement of ready manufacturing in your industry to get the full business impact of it. So, with that, I will end this presentation, and we will move to if there are any questions. Okay. So I think I'm a little early, but we can use this time. If there are any questions or queries, yes. Sir. Hello, participants. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, if not, give um, a copy of this presentation to Dr. Chitesh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The doctor's logger, and they can share it. This is confidential in this. Uh, I've presented, and you can always uh, anyone can reach me uh, or send me a mail at least, and I can see if I can address their queries today tomorrow. All right. Yes. Uh, right. Dear participants, if uh, you have any questions, so talk to directly, sir. Uh, I'll share my email ID with you, Doctor Fitch. Okay, okay, okay. The presentation is rather bulky, so I will put it on some Google Drive. So you can download. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. All right. Thanks, Thank sir. Thanks a lot, sir, for your valuable, valuable knowledge or this type of things. We are also working on 3D printing or topology optimization, and I also touch with you. Thank you thank you sir okay okay thank you sir thank you so much